And then before that, from 2003 to 2006, he was the vice president and general manager of the storage products division for Vitesse. Vitesse, okay. Good. Um, and then before joining Vitesse, he was the plant manager for Rockwell Semiconductor and was a member of the team responsible for the design and construction of the Rockwell Fab 8 wafer fabrication facility. You can talk to him more about that if you want to know. <laughs> but what I wanted to portray is he's got a lot of experience and he's very involved in our community and has been a vital asset to starting some really, some really cool projects here in town. Um, I think Kara Skinner may be available for questions afterwards or during our question and answer session. She is the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Colorado Springs. So we've got some smart financial people in the room. Um, but I think I'm just going to turn this over to Bob. So go All ahead. right. Well, good afternoon or good evening or whatever it is. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me along. I think uh, Dave uh, said, hey, come along and kind of go through some of the uh, our view of, of the, uh, the local economy. It's going to be a, kind of a different look um, today. And uh, so uh, what I want to try and do, once I've shut off the watch, uh, is kind of give you a big picture. And the genesis of this presentation, a friend of mine who's with a local Rotary Club, uh, Broadmoor Rotary Club, usually tries to get me along to do a presentation each year. And this last year, I said, well, we've done one on you know, the city committee, fire recovery, uh, quality of life indicators for United Way. I don't know. You know. And it was right at the time we voted in 2C, right, to go fix our roads. And I've lived in Colorado Springs now 35 years. I looked back, and when we first moved here, the sales tax that we paid to the city uh, for all purchases within the city uh, was 4.5%. Now it's 8.25%. That's interesting. Might be worth digging into. So that's the genesis of the presentation that we go through today, and it really kind of focuses on, you know, do we have a viable business model? And more importantly, do we have a plan to get to where we might want to be as a community? So, uh, hopefully everybody in the back can see this. Uh, in, for those of you who are in business, I think you're very familiar with these types of uh, metrics, right? Whether it's a profit and loss statement or a balance sheet. And uh, you've seen you know, sales, cost of goods sold, profit margin, etc., assets, liabilities, uh, very familiar with those in the business world. Okay, so how do those apply when you start to look at the local business? Well, for revenue, one of the metrics we can use, right, is gross metropolitan product. And that is nothing more than a subset of gross domestic product. And you're familiar with GDP figures that you hear the nation uh, come out with you know, every quarter. Cost of goods sold. Any economist will tell you G, uh, GMP, GDP is the output from labor and materials that basically is processed by a community to uh, provide value-added uh, value services or products. Uh, research and development, that's the innovation we have locally. Uh, marketing could be economic development, the regional business alliance. And then when you look at GNA, uh, those are the folks in government that provide the infrastructure, provide the services, uh, provide those uh, things that we need every day to function as a society. So let's look at the good news slides. Here we see the trend for Colorado Springs of gross metropolitan product over the last 20 years, uh, sorry, 15 years. And you can see it's a good chart up and to the right. So now Colorado Springs has a gross metropolitan product of around $27 billion a year, and that's grown from about $19 billion a year back in the year 2000, right, just after uh, the dot-com boom and bust cycle. So that's good. Cost of goods sold, right? A good proxy for that is the population. How many people do we have in Colorado Springs that are contributing to the output you saw on the previous slide? Here, and you're very familiar with your organization, perhaps more than anybody, we've seen our population grow throughout what's called the Metropolitan Statistical Area, which is El Paso County and Teller County combined. We have seen that grow from 550,000 people in the year 2000. Now this year probably will be at 700,000 people. 
So significant growth in population. Again, a cool place to live. We've seen Denver booming as well. Uh, the whole move to the Rocky Mountain region, all good. When we start to look at gross margin or productivity, we have a problem. You will see on this chart the economic output per person within the metropolitan statistical area is declining. We hit kind of a high point of $43,000 per person uh, back in the early 2000s, and you can see down to $38,000, $39,000 per person. So economic output going up, population going up, but productivity going down. So for those of you in business, you're having to hire, in theory, more people to get the same output. Not a good scenario. So the question is, are we competitive? Is this what other municipalities are seeing? Is this what the nation is seeing? The short answer to that is no. What you see on this chart is Colorado Springs is in the yellow bars. It is nothing more than a translation of the uh, chart that you saw previously. And you can see when you go up to uh, these lines here, right, this is Boulder, where they achieve $70,000 output per person per year. Uh, this red line is Denver, right? And then you get into uh, Austin, uh, which is always held up as the poster child across the United States for booming economic times, booming growth, you name it, they do it. But there's two things to note on this chart. Number one, not only the absolute value when we almost have half the economic output per person in Boulder, but look at the recent trends since the recession. Most of these lines are up and to the right. So after the recession, those municipalities recovered. Colorado Springs, unfortunately, has trended down. So we have not yet seen recovery from the last recession. So when we compare, this is kind of the, just for grins, so this is how we stack up compared to Detroit. Detroit has always looked at, you know, post the child of disaster, right? Car manufacturers shut down and everything else. But you'll see even Detroit's productivity is higher than Colorado Springs, which of course helps when the federal government puts in just a few billion dollars to recover your municipality. But nevertheless, certainly here, when we look at this trend, this is most concerning. And if you look at the long term, we never really recovered from the dot-com boom and bust back in the early 2000s. All right, so the question is, do we have a productive population? And the short answer to that is obviously uh, not as much as we would like. What this chart shows, and apologies for the folks in the back, three sections of this chart. First is population, right, in terms of absolute numbers and percentage change. Next chart, part of the chart is employment, how that changed. And then over here, workforce participation, how that changed. So Colorado Springs, right, has grown by 171,000 people since the year 2000. Uh, look at Austin. Austin has added the entire population of Teller County and El Paso County combined in 15 years. Denver is much far behind, has added 645,000 people in the same time period. But note here, uh, when you then go over and you say, okay, they added this many people, they added 240,000 jobs. We only added 11,000 jobs after bringing 171,000 more people to the community. So if you are in local government, for example, or the fire, police, right, uh, the folks that, you know, CARA works with every day, um, the challenge is you've got 171,000 more people wanting services, but only 11,000 people working, paying taxes and having discretionary income, right, to pay sales tax, property taxes, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera, for those services. Uh, notice Bo uh, Boulder, right? Added 22,000 more people, 13,000 jobs, right? They've had an interesting, for those who've been here for some time, an interesting constrained growth um, model, right? Where they had a moratorium on building in Boulder back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they kind of outsourced that to Niwot and Louisville and Longmont, etc. Uh, but it's provided a very effective way to grow. This is perhaps the most concerning thing here, where we look at workforce participation. 
back in the mid-90s, 1995, 50% of the total population of the area was in a salaried job. Okay? Uh, now we are down to 38%. So here you can see other municipalities have gone down as the population has aged and as jobs have maybe shifted overseas or to other locations. Uh, but you can see we by far and away had the biggest decline. Boulder, for example, didn't miss a beat. Right? They, they have the same workforce participation as they did 15 years ago. <laughs> the other thing we've got is quality jobs. Right? Uh, what you see here over the last, uh, this was just through 2012, we, we added healthcare, government, and uh, education jobs. One could say those are tax funded jobs, right? And we lost the jobs down here in an equal number that is manufacturing technology, information technology, those sorts of things. So these are tax generating jobs, these are tax funded jobs. This transition somewhat has gone uh, likewise across the United States, but I think more pronounced in Colorado Springs, uh, particularly when you add things like military contractors, et cetera, et cetera. So this could lead into the next slide. We have become very much a government-based economy. So the Regional Business Alliance, the guys that work on economic development, et cetera, uh, would estimate somewhere between 50 and 60% of our local economy depends on government funding. That could be direct local government, could be the military, could be military contractors. If you were having to put together a 10K or a 10Q or a prospectus for a publicly traded firm, you would have to put this situation in red letters all over the front of your prospectus to give the, your uh, shareholders a warning that you depend basically on one customer, the US government. So this is the challenge we have to segue out of this and get an economy that's viable. So this is where we are at today. It is not a viable position, right? We've seen a large population growth, very large population growth, that challenges local government to provide the services. But we haven't seen uh, the growth in employment and we've seen declining productivity. So for local government, whether it's county, uh, whether it's city, Right? We've got a high demand for services, but we haven't got the resources to pay for those services, hence we've had to increase tax rates. So as we look at the business outlook, we cannot continue on this track. Right? The only way you continue on this track is continue to increase sales taxes, inevitably increase property taxes, because in the end, we do need a fire department, we do need a police department, we do need roads, we need bridges, those sorts of things. But we've got to figure out how do we get the wherewithal to pay for those. So, yes, we can work on government efficiency. Yes, you know, we have to uh, increase tax levels probably in the short term. Dirty word, I know. But, you know, in the end, you have to deal with reality. Just like at the federal level, right, the next president's going to have to deal with $20 trillion in debt and a current unbalanced budget that generates a further half trillion dollars in debt per year, right? You can't run your bank account like that, right? In the end, it's going to catch up with you. So let's kind of segue on to, let's look at the impact for local government, right, and how uh, we go forward. So everybody's familiar, this is what really our local government people provide, right, from public safety to parks and everything else. This is how the Colorado Springs budget looked uh, in 2015, very crudely, $300 million for the city of Colorado Springs, of which $260 million is the general fund, then we have a specific public safety sales tax, which we voted in in the year 2000. This is how it's funded. Right? We primarily, the city of Colorado Springs, 60% of that $300 million comes from sales tax. Right? But the things to note, it doesn't all go to the city of Colorado Springs. We have PPRTA, we have the county, uh, we have the state's portion, and uh, on it goes. And now, of course, as you can see at the bottom, we have the 0.62% uh, 2C funding. Now let's look at the county. Everybody thinks their property taxes go to the county. Well, not really. As you can see on this chart, 
Most of it by far and away goes to your school districts. Second biggest chunk is going to the county. And for example, the county's property tax accounts for about 25% of the total county budget comes from property tax, the others comes from their sales tax collections and other federal block grants, etc. Uh, but notice here, the city of Colorado Springs only gets 7% of your property tax bill that you pay each year. And that's gone down uh, over half over the last 15 years as we have reduced property taxes in theory to avoid uh, Taylor, but that's been costly uh, to the city. This is the other challenge, the other dimension of property tax, right? There's the mill levy, and this how much your property is worth. Well, look at this chart. This was uh, from ERA Shields at the end of last year, right? Some of you may know it's kind of challenging if you're trying to sell a house over four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, right? Uh, this three hundred seventy-five number that they had here, right? That is the median home uh, price in Denver, and is one. $100,000 below the median home price in Boulder.